Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening. I guess I should say good evening to everyone, but wherever you are, it may not be evening based on registrations. It looks like we've got folks from all over the world. So uh, thanks to everyone that's here. I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, there's a lot to discuss, so I will apologize in advance. I, I, I had to leave some stuff on the cutting room floor, but I wanted to make sure that we were as thorough as possible with the information. There's, there's a lot going on. So let's just get underway, and hopefully there will be plenty of questions at the end uh, that I've already answered. But if not, I'm I'm happy to stay on as long as necessary to make sure that everybody gets a response. Um, so here's the operational update. We'll start with this. The on March 22nd, 2020, by order of the governor of Pennsylvania, the AP uh, the American Philatelic Center was closed. Uh, we moved staff and operations off site as quickly as possible. Uh, APS uh, and APRL staff proved flexible and creative in maintaining services to the greatest degree that we could. Um, there are several staff that are on the call tonight, and so I just want to express again my gratitude for all that they've done over the last seven weeks to help support and sustain APS members uh, and APRL operations to the greatest degree that they can while staying safe and at home. We, it, we did have a limited ability to provide full continuity for many of you who are uh, enjoying services that we offer, uh, like advertising, circuit sales, library, and stamp store, you know that there have been disruptions. We've worked to get those uh, mitigated to the greatest degree that we can, but on-site access is going to be necessary to get back to as close to normal as possible. Thank you for your patience, and we really appreciate that. So here's the update. Effective on Friday, May, uh, May the 8th, we are, uh, Center County will be in what's called phase yellow. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the governor has a three color code system that indicates where we are in the process. For us here in Belfont, we will be in code yellow effective May 8th. That means that the stay at home order will be lifted, um, although there are still plenty of restrictions that will uh, impact operations at the, at the APC. Uh, on May 11th, that's next Monday, a week from tonight, we will be allowing access of staff back into the building again. Now, there's gonna be some conditions to that. Over the last few weeks, we've been working on a back to business plan that would allow us to comply with the requirements of the state of Pennsylvania, as well as with uh, the Centers for Disease Control to ensure a safe environment for our staff while they're in the building and make sure that everything that we do is, is safe so that when we send material out to you that it is also uh, it is also as uh, risk-free. So our modified operations include face masks, social distancing, staggered work hours, and safe cleaning procedures. We have already undertaken the uh, safe cleaning procedures. We're working on that right now. We're also making sure that uh, all of the desks are located in a place that would be safe for two individuals to sit far enough apart from each other. Uh, we have an order of face masks on the way. And uh, in fact, we also now have more hand sanitizer than you can possibly imagine, though we will probably need more. For remote ready staff, that staff that don't need to enter the building, we expect them to continue to work from home. When we get to the green phase, that's when we'll start talking about bringing people in on a regular routine basis into the building. We're not there yet. I expect really that that will not happen probably until the end of the month or into the month of June. For the APC, for those of you who like to plan trips to the American Philatelic Center, I will tell you that we're closed to the public until at least June 1st. Now it's possible that we may have to extend that time pending the, uh, pending the findings of the governor and his, uh, his declaration of Center County and where we're able to be. But for right now, just in the interest of your safety and the hours, we're gonna maintain closed, uh, a closed building. Our primary goals right now, quickly increase member services. We wanna eliminate the backlog in those offices and try to address all of the uh, work that's been built up over the last seven weeks and get you back to normal as quickly as possible too. Obviously, we wanna focus on the safe uh, environment for our staff, make sure that they're able to come in and feel safe and then go home and uh, not be a risk to their loved ones. I want to say a special thank you to Michael Bloom, who's one of our who's on our board of directors. He's a director at large. Uh, Michael readily jumped to the opportunity to help us secure a thousand face masks, and they are uh, at least half of that order is currently in transit, and we expect to have those this week so that when the staff returns next week, they will be safe and sound. 
I also want to say thank you to Big Spring Distillery. That is a one of our tenants here at the uh, Match Factory location. They are a distillery of uh, fine liquors. If you partake, I certainly do recommend it when you get a chance to visit us again to stop by Big Spring and uh, shop their wares. But right now they're in the process of uh, making hand sanitizer. And uh, Kevin, who's the owner of the, uh, the facility, donated 60 bottles of eight ounce hand sanitizer to us today. That should get us through for a while, but uh, obviously if anybody's got a bead on more hand sanitizer, we certainly will take you up on the offer of tracking it down and getting it shipped here. So let's go into some of the affected operations. Expertizing is the, uh, was the most significantly impacted. So we've just started getting things back to normal again in terms of starting to circulate material. Uh, we reopened new submissions as of April the 23rd. We communicated that to our, our customers. So if you've got certs that you're waiting to send in, please go ahead, get them in the mail, get them to us. And uh, Gary and, and Crystal will be ready to go next Monday to get, uh, get those in the queue. Our expert committee, the experts are completing and returning any outstanding work that they have right now. Uh, they've been working on that. Some of them have already had the work done and are, are sending it in to us. We're getting larger volumes of mail these days. So I know that uh, a lot of business is picking up for us. Our first priority is finalizing and returning completed opinions by May 13th. So by next week, all of the opinions that we have in hand will be in your hand as soon as possible right after that. Uh, Crystal's been doing a lot of work at home to make sure that she's prepped and ready to go. It's really just a matter of pulling all the pieces together getting it in the mail to you and making sure that everything is right when it gets back to your place. Uh, number two, getting uh, expert committee to finish return patients as quickly as possible to us so that we can get those in the queue to get back out to you. Uh, or if they need to go to another expert, then to go ahead and get them in the mail. Uh, new submissions to the expert committee, as you are getting them into us, we're gonna turn around and get them back out again. So we'll have those mailings out and ready to go no later than May the 20th. Hopefully things will move a little quicker than that, but we're going to get that backlog cleaned up as quickly as possible. If you have any questions, uh, Gary Lowe always tells me to tell you this, that he and Crystal are at home uh, right now. They are eager and ready to help you in every way that you can. If you have a question, a comment, or a crisis, please get in touch with them and let them know. I've got their contact information on the screen, and uh, you certainly can touch base with them. Circuit sales. So we have communicated to sellers that they can send new books. For those of you who aren't selling stamps on circuit sales, but you've always thought it would be interesting to try it out, this is a good time to go ahead and do that. We've got a lot of folks out there who are staying at home, who are going through material and looking to buy, and this is your chance now that you've spent the last uh, seven or eight weeks organizing your material, finding your duplicates and so forth. This is a good way to get, to get that material into the hands of somebody who wants to give it a good home. Uh, for our sellers, you've been waiting patiently and we thank you for that. We're going to generate checks by May the 20th to get out to you. Uh, those first checks will be probably some doozies because we've, uh, we've got about seven weeks of time to catch up. It'll be about eight, nine weeks by the time we get there. For the circuits, we, uh, please, for those of you who've got circuits, we've got about 300 out, on the, uh, out in the circuit right now. If you've got a circuit in your hands, please go ahead and move it on to the next person so that we can go ahead and get our circuits restarted again. Uh, we are mailing circuits now. As a matter of fact, we sent out a large batch today, uh, initiated and moving out so that we can get stamps into your hands as quickly as possible. Direct sales books, we are accepting requests now. Uh, we've done some mailings of those. I think we did 40 or 50 last week to people who wanted to just get a direct circuit sent to them. So we did that. Um, late fees are gonna be waived until June the 1st. Uh, we do not expect any extensions beyond that because we are working now over the next month to get the circuits moving again. And that's that's really what we're after for the sellers and the buyers. I know that everybody's eager to get a hold of uh, some stamps, take a look at them and make some purchases. So we want to help them with that. If you have questions, you can contact Wendy Mazzorti, who's our director of sales, or Carol Hoffman, who is her right hand there in the circuit sales office. Carol has been working very hard in this break. I will say this uh, to brag about her for a minute. Uh, she's been working to keep things as straight as humanly possible with circuit sales, making sure that our staff offsite can get things done. And I really am grateful for the work she's done. She's done fantastic for us. Stamp store. Now, for many of you who know, 
Stamp Store has been open the entire time. We did have a brief shutdown over a 48 hour period, but we decided to go ahead and start selling material again as we worked through a solution to get the material to you once you purchased it. It was not next business day, which is our standard operating procedure, but we're, you know, we are moving now. So we have, it's up to three weeks. Some folks are getting it sooner than others, but we do expect to be caught up by June the 1st. For sellers, we are accepting new material for posting. Some have mailed in. For the rest of you, please do. For those of you who don't sell on stamps or it's an incredible service. All you have to do is send us the stamps with descriptions. We do a lot of the hard work for you. We do the scanning and the posting. We answer all the questions that come in. We fulfill the orders and and all you have to do is stay home and count your money once it starts coming in. It's a very popular option, but it's not just eBay. It's the service that goes with it. And it's very it, it's a great service. And I know a lot of people really benefit from that. Seller payments. Also, like with circuit sales, we expect to have those generated in the mail by May the 20th. Um, I know a lot of you have been eagerly waiting. We're working on getting our return sorted out right now so that we can pay you as much as possible by the time we get those checks generated on May the 20th. Questions, contact Wendy Mazzorti, who's the director of our sales operation, and she will certainly get back to you ASAP. Library services. We, we know that a lot of folks who've been using library services have been communicating with staff. Uh, they've been triaging out the emails back and forth so that we can be as responsive as possible to you. Uh, research requests, our goal is to eliminate the backlog by June the 1st. Once we get people back on site again, We've handled a lot of those requests off-site, but there's still some that we have to come in and grab resource material to reference material to be able to share with you information you need. So uh, that's going to begin in earnest again next week, and we hope to eliminate the backlog by June the 1st. Books, it's time to start returning the over to books if you have not done that already. I have been working in the library on site. Uh, I know a lot of you have sent books back, but for those of you who still have them, please get them back to us so that we can get them in the hands of somebody else who might want them and need them. Late fees. We are waiving late fees until June the 1st. I don't expect there to be an extension beyond that because things are starting to gear a little more normal again. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of in influx of mail. So we know that people are, are starting to put things back in the mail again. Loan requests starting next week. We have outstanding loan requests that we will get to as quickly as possible. For those of you who, who've been wanting to get a hold of a, a reference uh, book or something like that, we are going to start taking requests on May the 11th, and we'll start getting those out as quickly as possible. For questions, contact the library staff, library at stamps.org. Um, like I said, they tend to triage out the questions so we can get to you fast as possible, and uh, I know they're responding around the clock. So. For those of you who know, I was in government before I came here, and there's always sort of a, once you hit a, a moment like this, there's really a pathway to getting back out of it again. I've characterized it in three ways that I think it's easy for me to remember, certainly, but hopefully it's easy for you to remember, too, how we're working toward getting back to getting through this process and getting to the, uh, the other side of it. The first is obviously respond. That's what we've been doing since March the 22nd. And, you know, it is our goal to make sure that we are being as responsive as humanly possible to you. During this period, there's going to be some disruptions, there's going to be some challenges, but we are uh, not only trying to, you know, try to provide our normal services for you, but we've been expanding that to include other things. Uh, the second part of this is recover. We're going to start working our way into that period. Here, we still need to be somewhat flexible and make sure that we are uh, we are staying safe and secure. A lot of times that's going to mean we're going to work from home, but we are going to work to build normal as quickly as possible and be as flexible as possible. And I can tell you this, the staff has done a great job with doing that. And I, I have a, a lot of confidence that we're going to get back to uh, a, a full, you know, a full fledged operation pretty quickly. The last is rise. Once you get through all of this, we're going to do a lot of evaluation through these first two periods and start really thinking about how we deliver services, what we should be prioritizing, and how we should be delivering those service to, services to you as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. And if, if we have a second wave, for instance, are we ready to close the entire building back down again and try to have it without as many disruptions as we had this time? So just to brag point, I want to highlight some of the things that we've done to respond to the crisis, not just for 
us closing down the building, but for what you're going through on a daily basis. And many of our members are stuck at home uh, in quarantine, staying safe, and uh, they've not been able to enjoy the social aspects of the hobby to the degree that they normally do. So first was our priority was service continuity. We quickly moved off site to minimize disruptions. Yes, there were some disruptions, but uh, we're, we're, we've laid a lot of the groundwork and foundation to get back to normal as quickly as possible. Communications, for those of you who are not a fan of email, I am sorry, but you know we really feel like it was important to stay constant with the evolving situation that we had here and in the hobby as well. And so we, we really upped the number of communications we sent out, the frequency that we sent them, we're not trying to bombard you with all sorts of other things. This is really just information you can use and ways that you can pass the time and ways that you can connect with in the hobby to whatever degree that you want. The hobby impact. I think the most significant thing that's occurred is we haven't had a stamp show since uh, you know mid-March. And on the horizon, it doesn't look like we've got any scheduled until July at the earliest. Now, we don't know what, what's going to happen there. We're going to continue to monitor events. And a lot of the show chairs have kept us in the loop and communicated with us. They've had questions and concerns, but we want to keep you posted and updated as events develop. So make, make sure you keep coming back to the website to keep an eye on the schedule. Uh, hopefully we can get to a stamp show soon, but we want that to be a safe event. Uh, so that's what we're going to keep working on. Stamp chats. We recognized immediately that there was a complete break in your routine, whether you go to a stamp club or whether you go to a stamp show or a variety of other things, you needed something to fill your time on a social side, being able to connect with other, you know, other members of the APS, other stamp collectors, share your enthusiasm in the hobby. And that's what we, we wanted to do. We wanted to step into the gap and make sure that you could be connected every day. One of the interesting things that I've seen over the last seven weeks is a, ready, uh, a readily adaptable group of people um, that many people don't outside of our hobby don't give you credit for. And, you know, watching our members adapt to an online world and get connected through Zoom and go to meeting and a lot of our other different online platforms has been really interesting to see. The stamp chats have been informative and educational. They've been a great way to connect with other collectors. I've met a lot of people I've not been able to meet before. And I appreciate all of you who've participated, who've taught, and, uh, and who have made those a very meaningful event content. We've added hundreds of hours of YouTube uh, content, so video content, movies, the stamp chats are put up there, all of the other APS events are put up there as well, and we have been working very hard to keep posting new and useful information to our website, not just for our members, but also for people who are sheltering in place, who are starting to dabble a little bit in something a little different than just watching streaming videos all day long, and stamp collecting is one of those places where we're seeing a lot of pickup. I'll get to this, the the data behind that point a little bit later on. Easy access. We dropped our members only access to the American Philatelist, the Philatelic Literature Review, and the APRL. There are two reasons for doing that. Number one is it's, it's good advertising for us to be able to share what this hobby is about and what the APS is about with people who haven't had time to stop and look at us before. So we're using the opportunity of the captive audience to be able to give them a, a rich, example of what stamp collecting is all about and the the value behind being a member of the APS. The second part of that is we want you to have bragging rights. You have been trying to pitch, you know, uh, your grandchild or you've been trying to pitch a friend for years that they need to get into the hobby. And what we wanted to do is because you helped pay for this, we wanted to give you that free resource to share with them and say, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is why I've been a member of the APS and I want you to be an APS member too. And we've heard time and again, people who've been able to send magazine articles to, uh, to friends of theirs and other things. And so we really appreciate you using that time to share the APS with them and encourage them to join and at least, or at least start collecting stamps. And so we really appreciate that. APR Digital, that's been one of the uh, resources that we put online and opened up for non-members to, to access. It's a very rich resource and we're work, we've now decided to prioritize and make it a little bit better. Uh, right now we have 11 complete runs of journals, 2,978 issues available to you. The American Philatelist, the uh, Philatelic Literature Review are two primary ones, but there are many others that are in there as well. 
We have 44 exhibits right now, 4,346 pages worth of exhibiting material. We have five books, three movies, two maps, two country references, and the American Banknote company files, all of which are very interesting uh, to look at. And I would encourage you to go in and take a look at those as, as reference material if you would be interested in that. Coming soon, uh, we've got 15 complete runs of journals that we're ready to move over. Uh, Scott and Marion Mills have shared with me some very interesting statistics about how long it takes to get that PDF scan over to a usable searchable version that you can get through uh, APRL Digital. Remember, this is the important critical piece of this is not just to make it available to you, but make sure that you can actually find what you're looking for as quickly as possible rather than having to go through, for instance, with the American Philatelist having to go through over 130 years worth of material, you can search and those the search results come up for you fairly quickly. We've got three more in discussion as well. Our goal is to really build out a rich library of the journals. If you've ever been to the library, you know that there are an inordinate number of journals here. We're working through getting permissions and getting those loaded up, making sure that those who've provided them to us, that we're following their wishes and complying with their wishes, they vary from group to group. So we wanna make sure that we we honor that because we want this to be a depository for all journals, ultimately. Uh, we've got 129 exhibits sitting in the queue ready to go, over 10,000 pages of uh, exhibit material. I am going to send a request out for those of you who are exhibitors. I'm going to send a request out very soon, asking and encouraging you, maybe a little bit more directly than we've done in the past, to share those exhibits with us so that we can put those in that digital library and make them a great resource for people to do research. Uh, it doesn't need to be a perfect version of your, uh, your you know, beyond your gold winning uh, award status, but we really want to make sure that we can get the research to them and that they're able to benefit from the work that you've done in a meaningful way. So how are we going to do this? Well, we had developed and we're planning to do an adopt a book program this year, the focus of which was to help educate on what we're doing with the digital library, what resources we're making available, and then encouraging you to donate through the Adopt-A-Book program to help us accelerate that program. The COVID outbreak sort of moved the, the chains a little bit for us to move it ahead a little quicker. And I wanna make sure that we get that information out to you. We launched it just last week. We've gotten, a, uh, we've gotten some nice response to it, even though it's been somewhat of a soft advertisement. We're gonna to continue to work more directly with you to make you aware of the program and encourage you to give. So our aim is to fund digitization to accelerate the APRL digital growth. I walked over sort of what we have available to us, but we have not even scratched the surface yet on digitizing the books, working through the permissions and getting those scanned and then getting them uploaded into the system so that's also a searchable document for you. We need additional hardware, software, storage, and personnel. It's a very time consuming process. We wanna be able to make the process move a little quicker along. Uh, you know, a journal can take as much as three hours to get converted and up, and that's an incredibly laborious process. Think about that. Just one journal takes that long. So if you've got a run of 100 journals, you can do the math. And so being able to add our resources and increase our capability to get those up sooner would really be helpful to us. Benefits, increased access to the APRL collections. One of the things that I hear so often is, oh, Belfont's so far away or it's so hard to get to, and in this time, people just aren't traveling. Well, I don't want that to be the obstacle to you being able to access the material. We have spent you know, a very long time accumulating this collection and it's for your benefit and it's for you. And we wanna make sure that you can get to that information as quickly as possible. The initial goal for our, pro our project is $25,000. That'll, that'll help us really get infrastructure and movement going to get those journals uploaded. Uh, last I checked, I think we raised somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1,000, both online and off, for the Adopted Book Program. Not bad for a week, uh, considering all the other things that are going on. So we're going to encourage you to, to review that. Um, it's kind of a neat idea, because you can adopt your favorite book or your resource. You get to share a little bit about that. Why is it your favorite book? And then in that book will go a nameplate, which looks a little something like this, that will memorialize your contribution to the cause. Uh, for as long as we have that book, which is probably going to be a very long time. We'll also do some recognitions in some other ways, but you know, we want to make sure that you recognize for that. And we, more importantly, want you to share the story behind why you chose those books. 
that's something that I think will really help encourage people not only to, to give to the program, but to use the library. And that's where really what we're always after. So you can join today. There's the link for the adopt -a book program. We have a nice online platform for you to go and make donations to. You can share your story. You can read a little bit about other people who are making donations as time goes on. And I think it'll be a really fun and interesting way to highlight the value of what we have in the library. Summer seminar. Uh, this is probably one of the most popular programs we do on any given, in any given year. And last year was no exception to that. But uh, this year, our 40, 41st annual summer seminar has been closed, uh, canceled due to the COVID outbreak. Uh, so we worked very quickly to develop an online replacement. And um, I wanna give uh, thanks to Kathy Brackville and Kathleen Edwards who have been working very closely with a, a large number of eager volunteers who wanna teach a course online. And it's, you know, rather than being a single week in June, we're now looking at a much longer set of events that'll happen over the entire month of June. We have over 50 different sessions and we have live and recorded sessions. There will be some uh, APS focused material. There'll be some philatelic related material. So there's gonna be a lot of variety to what's being offered there. The course catalog is online and we wanna make sure that you go and visit that. Now, this is only for APS members. We're, the free sessions are gonna be open to the public, but the, the, the paid sessions, if you will, are gonna be for APS members only. We wanna make sure that you benefit the most from uh, this resource that we've put forth. And so you've got one hour sessions that are $10 each, and then you'll have multi-session courses that are priced accordingly, depending on the length of time. Uh, will depend on the price. If you uh, uh, if you want more information on that to register, uh, registration is not available currently, but it will be going up very soon. There's the link though. It has the course catalog and a lot of other information about it, and you can start looking through what you might be interested in, and we'll get the sign up for you very soon. Uh, stamps for Champs. This is something that's new, brand new, as a matter of fact. Uh, we are just consider this an announcement that you all would not have heard about otherwise. Um, as a humble thanks to the everyday heroes in the medical profession, the utility industry, the frontline services sustaining us during the COVID-19 crisis, we wanted to give something back. And so what we're asking of you is in exchange for this, we're going to offer a one-year digital uh, subscription. This is an online membership. It doesn't include mailing the AP out, uh, but we want to give them a, a thank you and give them a chance to when they're able, get back, you know, get into the hobby or get back into the hobby so that they can relieve stress and be a part of a community that really appreciates everything that they're doing. So here's what we're asking. We have a website. What we want you to do is if you want to submit a nomination for a, an everyday here for a Stamps for Champs uh, membership, all we ask you to do is submit online a, the name and contact information and why you think that they're worthy of it so that we can share that story. We want people to know that this is going to, to someone who's really been doing something and dedicated themselves to us. We are gonna limit it to one, per, uh, one nomination per APS member. Uh, you know, There could be a lot of any number of people that you've met out there that are doing something really exceptional right now, uh, but we wanna make sure that we make it manageable. The offer will end uh, on August the 24th, 2020. That's supposed to be the, uh, the day after our last day of uh, the Great American Stamp Show. We'll get into that discussion a little bit later on, but we scheduled it so that if we are able to do the show in August, this would be one of the things we could promote and talk about while we're there. And I think by then we'll be able to share some really interesting stories with you. You can nominate now, and there's the address for the website. Uh, we will have more information coming later this week that will outline a little bit more. If you're eagerly awaiting the June, you're just about to get the uh, May issue of the American Philatelist, but in the June AP, I talk about it a little bit more so that you, uh, you can understand it. But we'll have some more information up now and really would encourage you to take a look at that. And if you know someone special that's worthy of it, please, please nominate them. So I want to say thank you very much to Jeff Shapiro, who's uh, on the board of directors. He's one of our vice presidents. This was an idea that that Jeff came up with, and I, you know, he sent me an email and didn't really want to make it sort of a public thing. So I'm sorry, Jeff, and I'm calling you out here. But uh, but I shared it with our staff, and there was a lot of enthusiasm about the idea because 
we 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 don't know what we can offer, but this is one way that we can say thank you to folks who've been working very hard and how much we appreciate what they're doing. Great American Stamp Show. Well, this is a bit of a vexing problem for us. As you know, many different folks are working on uh, trying to do meeting planning this year and it's darn near impossible and we're no exception to that rule. Uh, right now, we're still scheduled to go August the 20th to the 23rd in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, we also are aware of the health conditions that are going on there right now. We've been monitoring that very closely with the staff and some other local officials. Uh, and they are more challenged than many other parts of the country in terms of having an infection rate and death rate. So we don't know where that's going to go right now. Uh, the Connecticut Convention Center does has no scheduled events through July. They have three planned for August, and all three of us are sort of in the same boat in terms of trying to figure out and determine exactly whether or not we can go forward with the show or not. Uh, our goal is to get a clear decision from the convention center leadership by May the 15th. We have upped our communication because so many members are trying to make arrangements and plans to get there. And uh, we don't want them to buy tickets if they if they we ultimately have to cancel the show. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that if they are coming, that they're able to make plans and get there in a necessary amount of time. Um, our partners, once we get a clear determination from the convention center, you know, we'll work with the American Topical Association, the American First Day Cover Society to to figure out what we're going to do next. One of the one of the unfortunate circumstances that is surrounding this COVID-19 is this was going to be the first year we had a, a three partner national show. We we've been doing it for the last few years with the American Topical Association. And I think most people would agree they've been incredibly successful shows a lot of good energy. We felt like adding the American First Aid Cover Society was a good decision for us and for them, and that we would be able to bring additional opportunities to enjoy a stamp show while you're in-house. And unfortunately, we've we've hit a bit of a, a, a bump here in the road, but we're going to work together to continue to communicate with you as best we can and as effectively as we can. Thank you very much for your patience and your understanding. Uh, and, and I'm really sorry that we all have to go through this together, uh, but we are going to get a solution and a resolution to this as quickly as possible. So what's next? Well, if you watched the, the, the board meeting a couple weeks ago, I used this, uh, I used the same slide. Um, so apologies if you have to sit through this twice. John Kennedy, back when he was running said, uh, for president said the Chinese used two brushstrokes to write the word crisis. One brushstroke stands for danger, the other for opportunity. In a crisis, be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. Uh, it's more commonly known as crisis equals opportunity. It's often used in the business world, in the political world, and a lot of other places to highlight that when you're in the midst of a crisis, there are opportunities to do things. Now, if you understand Chinese, you know that he's incorrect. And um, although it isn't true, you know, we still accept that it's our call to action. And so we see this crisis as an opportunity. And I think many of you have been experiencing the changes that have been going on, not just with the APS, but with your hobby in general. And I think it's somewhat encouraging to see those things happen and we wanna to continue to facilitate those. So what are our big opportunities? Well, we need to be a more flexible organization. One of the hallmarks of the hobby, one of the hallmarks of the APS is its adherence to tradition. Sometimes that can be a little bit of an obstacle. We have to figure out how we can honor the traditions of the hobby, but at the same time become a much more flexible organization. We have to defend and grow revenue opportunities. If you go back and look at the uh, Great Recession of 2008, 2009, and you're a student of the APS, you know that we took a membership loss that was pretty substantial. Now, in fairness, it happened to coincide with a change in our dues from $35 that we'd set in 2003 to $45, which is the current due structure that you pay today. We don't have that in the works. Um, that was inadvertent at the time. You, no one, the board certainly didn't expect there to be a global meltdown that happened the following year after they approved that. But we, we want to work very hard to continue to earn your business. We don't want to see you go away. And so we're working very hard to make sure that you want to stay a member of the APS. But at the same time, we also want to diversify our revenue stream so that it is not just about your dues being our lifeblood, but rather that we don't, and we don't feel the pressure to have to raise those dues, but rather that we can continue to deliver services and be able to serve you without asking more money out of your pocket to pay an annual membership. 
we have to reduce and manage costs to maintain our financial strength. This is something we've already been doing. And for those of you who've listened to previous discussions, you know that we're working very aggressively to look at our budget, identify low priority opportunities to save money right now so that we can stay focused on delivering services to you and working on that flexibility piece as best we can. Curate our assets, strengthen our balance sheet, and manage for cash. Those are our priorities. We've, we've had that philosophy really since 2016. All credit to the board of the APS and the APRL board. They've taken a very different and unique view of financial management than what I had expected when I got here. And you know what they have done and what we have done together is focus very much so on keeping our cash flow strong, keeping our operations lean so that we don't grow beyond our capabilities. So that when this time came, now we certainly didn't expect it to be this bad, but when this time came that we were able to handle it much more effectively than in times past. So I think if you get a chance to say thank you to an APS or an APL board member, please do, because the, the things that we've accomplished over the last four years are the reason why I can stand here today and have this conversation with you and talk about planning, not panicking. And so it's their leadership that's been integral to this and I appreciate all that they have done on that front. So we've, we wanna accelerate our technology use. This has been a strategic plan of ours for a while. And now we're sort of, our hand has been forced to get into that side of it. And so if we're gonna do it, we wanna do it properly. So we're evaluating what we're delivering. We're figuring out how we can do it best for you without creating a, a whole different kettle of uh, multiple programs that are confusing and, and serve a very few number of people. We wanna be able to deliver quality content to you and we wanna do that as efficiently as possible and make you enjoy the hobby, not frustrate you with dealing with the APS. Oh. Meet members' expectations and address risk quickly. Part of the reason why we've been communicating so frequently with you is it's absolutely important to make sure that you know what's happening here what's happening in the hobby and, and what's happening uh, to everything that we do that impacts you directly. And that's something that we're not gonna back away from easily. We wanna stay connected with you as best we can uh, because this is gonna extend for a while. We don't know how long. And so we have to accept that the, the one of the ways that we continue to do business is electronic communication. We share information with you. Um, if it's too much before you unsubscribe from an email, please just call us and say, okay, enough already, I've heard it. Uh, and you know, when we, we wanna make sure that we keep you engaged in what's happening here. So we talked so much about digital. I wanted to share a little bit of information with you. I've talked about this in board meetings before, but for the larger audience, this is uh, information you may not have heard. Uh, monthly users. So last year on our website, our average monthly users were about 30,000 a month. That's a uh, that's an increase from roughly about 22,000 a month in 2018. Um, if Martin Miller is on the call, uh, I want to recognize him. He endured a lot to move our website from what it was into the platform that we're using now. And he'll never probably get enough credit for the, the laborious work it took to re-architect that website and get us to where we could make it functional and make it something that was useful for, for many people. So our target for this year is 40,000 a month, uh, which we were working our way toward. We really didn't expect to hit that number until November of 2020. In April, we hit 47,300 people. Uh, now, understand, I think the number is gonna drop down again. How much, I don't know, but we have certainly introduced an entire new audience to stamps.org. But for those of you contemplating that number, what you need to do is understand that our circulation for our magazine is about 26,000. So we've not only hit our circulation for the magazine, but we've almost done it again. And that's why I talk so much about the value of investing in technology is because we can reach a broader audience. We've got to draw them in, give them a reason to come to the website, and then they can check things out for themselves. And uh, we're working very hard to give them as many options as they can to become an APS member. Sessions per month. So, you know, we also count the number of times that individuals uh, come to the website. So some of you come more than once a month and we hope so, uh, that we've got information there that's of use to you and of value to you. So our average in 2019 was 56,000 a month. Uh, our target for 2020 is 150,000 a month. Now, in April, we hit our highest number ever 
at 78,000 sessions per month. What that means is that we do have new people coming. They're not sure what they're looking for yet, uh, or they're not sure if they want to come back yet. So this is about getting them in the door. And it may take a month or two for them to feel comfortable enough to use the website multiple times. So we, the, the good news, the good development here is that we're moving toward our goal. Um, the bad news is, is we haven't gotten them hooked yet, so we're going to keep working on that. I want to talk about search impressions for a second. This means people who go to Google, go to Bing, go to other search engines, and they type in something that might trigger them to come to our website. Uh, the industry terms is search engine optimization. And part of the reason why we have developed the newsroom and the content is to build out enough information and enough meta tags so that they can come to our website so that we organically show up in their searches to begin with. So our average in 2019 was 477,000 a month, 500 a month. Uh, in April, we hit a staggering number of 1.29 million. Now we were ramping up. We were in the 650 to almost 700,000 range anyway, starting at the end of last year and moving up. We continue to move up, but this was a phenomenal moment to see this number and realize we have never been here before. That means people are searching something so closely related to what we're doing on the website that we showed up in their top line searches and that our Google ad, which is a uh, for nonprofits is a free of charge, um, that that Google ad is also showing up with it because whatever information they're searching for, whether it's the price of stamps or uh, the American Philatelic Society or something about the Great American Stamp Show, those are some of the top 10 searches that, that generate impressions and clicks to our website. So I want to talk about the click-through rate for a second. What that means is that once that once that option shows up, then we get to the click-through rate. In 2019, about almost 16,000 a month was was our average. In April, we got to 32,000 a month, so we doubled that number. And I think that's a pretty substantial uh, change because that means we're showing up a lot more frequently, and people are really starting to understand what we do. They're also willing to click through to our website because we've become a trusted part of the internet community. And so I value that and I wanna thank everybody that's helped contribute to that. So just for fun, I wanted to show you how the web traffic works so I can talk to you a little bit about how we're analyzing that. If you can see this, this is our 10 most popular page views. Number one with a bullet is the newsroom. The reason why that matters is because I've talked about a content strategy for a very long period of time and without some demonstration of proof, it, it's really just, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are just sitting there going, well, that sounds great, but what does it mean? The answer is, this, this means that 43,000 page views happened as a result of the work that we're doing on the content. If you go to the newsroom, what you see is on a daily basis, we're adding new information, new articles about stamp collecting, new information about the APS and services, what you're doing in the hobby, any number of things. And those are starting to show up as, new, as, as hot items. This is our number one spot to go to now. It used to, be, uh, it used to be new issues, which is number two on the list. So what this shows you is if you really wanna see the delta in traffic, that 43,870 is entirely organically driven, brand new people showing up at our website. Those page views are brand new versus what else you see on this list. Now, what I will tell you is that the rest of these numbers start benefiting from that because we have started putting tags to other pages on very popular uh, pages that people come to. So if you come to a newsroom item, you may see a link to go to the dealer directory because it's related to what you're looking at there. Same thing with new issues, which is always going to be a very popular place for us. But I want to highlight that the dealer directory for any APS dealer members who are on the call with us right now, we're driving traffic to the dealer directory and they are engaging. And what I, what's interesting is if we look at the weekly numbers of this, it's about 2,000 a week. And, um, you know, that's encouraging. One of the things that helped do that is we put uh, logos and pictures of dealers on there. So if you got a request from the APS to do that, you helped us make that site more attractive for people to come and visit. Um, for those of you who have not sent us a logo or a picture, I would encourage you to do that so that when your name shows up in the search, there you are. And it really helps generate more traffic to the website, specifically to the dealer database, which is the largest uh, in the entire US. And we're very proud of that. We have over 500 dealer members and um, all of them are still selling material today. And we wanna make sure that they're getting the biggest audience possible through the APS. 
club directories. For those of you who are leadership ambassadors or members of local stamp clubs, this is how much traffic we're driving to you. Our goal is to run this number up as high as we can so that people in your community can find you, can find out what you're doing. So it's important and very, very necessary for you to review your club information today. Make sure that it's all up to date. If you have a website on there that is a dead link, it turns people off. If you have an email address for someone who's not even a member of the club anymore, it turns them off. So please go make sure that your, your club database is, is updated, that directory is updated, and that we can make sure that we can get them connected to you as quickly as possible. This is how we're going to help the grassroots. This is one of the very meaningful ways that we can do it because as we continue to drive our web traffic up, these are the places where they're going to go and we wanna make sure that they get good information when they get there. So online learning, one of the questions I've gotten over the last you know, seven weeks is whether or not we're gonna to continue to do stamp chats. And the answer is yes, sort of. So let me talk about this real quick. Right now, this is what we're offering. Uh, we have the Collecting and Connecting Central, C3A. We've had about 800 members sign up for uh, access to the, the site and go through some of the coursework that's on there. We're gonna continue to add to that. We have Stamp Chats. This is something we introduced at the COVID outbreak and something that we're gonna continue going forward. What you'll notice if you look at the, if one of you, if you're regularly watching Stamp Chat schedules, uh, when we release our schedule today, they're, they're less frequent. We know that there are stamp clubs now meeting online, and we know that there are other organizations like the Collectors Club of New York and the Royal Philatelic Society who are also sponsoring talks. We're not here to try to block people out. We're here to, to lift everyone up. And so one of the things we know we have to do is step back on the amount of, of uh, obligation and responsibility and give other folks space to provide their content online as well. And we really encourage that. Uh, we have educational movies. We, for those of you who have been members of Stamp Clubs for a long time, you remember the old slide programs, which we converted to DVDs. Well, now we're digitizing them completely. So if, you, if and when you get to the point where you're doing a Stamp Club meeting online, you can go and look at the movies that we have, and you can do a watch along with everyone there, and then you can talk about it afterwards, or, uh, or this is just something to kill some time while you're sitting at home and you've watched everything you could possibly watch on Netflix, I think the stuff is more interesting anyway. You probably do too. Uh, we have Summer Seminar Online. This is a relatively new phenomenon, but it highlights the need for us to do educate, you know, more education, especially more live education online. We are a sponsor of Exploring Stamps. That's an educational program. And if you've not been over there yet, uh, Graham Beck is an APS member. He's been doing this since 2016. He's doing phenomenal work where, you know, he has an eight to 12 minute video that's focused uh, on a topic specific or a country specific. And it's, it's great for stamp collectors of all ages. And it's, you know, a very fun and engaging way to do it. I really appreciate all the work that Graham's doing on that. And we're proud to be a sponsor of Exploring Stamps. So we had to evolve. The first thing we did is we established the Committee on Online Learning. Uh, I did this for the staff so that I could call them the cool kids. Uh, this is a group, internal group, working group that all of whom have some touch point on educational programs for the APS. And what we wanted to do was, was develop a little bit of a more thoughtful process to the way we do it. So we want to coordinate and refine our online educational opportunities for you, figure out how they should be delivered, how they could be, you know, how they can be marketed, making sure that you get the most out of every event that we offer and that you're able to participate and not finding out at the last minute, those sorts of things. Um, we need to do a digital year round event driven educational program. Uh, you know, the, the, for instance, the summer seminar online is gonna be through the month of June, but what about the 11 other months that are going on out there? And you know, with the stamp chats and some other things as well, we don't want this to be relegated to a moment in time. We want this to be something that you get value out of all year long. Online education is consistently in every, survey and every poll that we have done with APS members is we are not doing enough. And so an online leads the way in terms of making sure that we can get that to you on your time and in your home without asking you to travel halfway across the country in order to take part of it. So it's very important for us that we're able to deliver this for you. And we're going to have a final play plan in May. Some of those changes you'll start seeing immediately. I, you know, I think some interim steps are being taken right now. By the end of the week, we'll have done even more. And by the 20th, give or take, 
uh, I should have a final plan in hand that's going to talk about what year-round online education looks like for the APS and how we can deliver that, both the resource side of things and the marketing side of things as well. So how can you help? Well, be safe. Um, stay at home if you have to. Uh, stay at home if you can and make sure that you're still organizing and going through your collection. Uh, we want to help you in every way get rid of your duplicates. We want to help you in every way add to your collection. That's why we're working so hard to get everything back online here so that you have more availability to stamps to buy and sell. Uh, communi communicate, stay in touch with each other. Um, I think it's been fantastic to see clubs start building out their online meeting capabilities because some of them, are, some folks are looking at uh, months before they're able to meet again. Um, there's some clubs who've gone to a weekly meeting because it is stay at home and they're able to get members that they haven't seen in a while because they haven't been able to come for scheduling conflicts or some other reasons. And so um, stay in touch with your friends, email, phone, call. It's really important that we stay connected to each other in a time like this. Uh, share. We have a captive audience right now. We have provided as much resource as possible at no cost to anyone. That time is limited, though. By the end of this month, it is all going to go away. It will be your benefit again. But for the time being, this is your brag point. This is an organization you've invested time in, money in, and we want you to be able to go out and tell folks, this is what I belong to, and this is why I belong to it, and you should too. Buy and sell. Circuit sales and stamp stores are great APS services. For those of you who've never used them before, I encourage you to start. It's going to be very important for us to build that business this year, uh, be able to sell your stamps. Again, by now, I think that people have got some stuff, material on hands that they're looking to, to move and material they're looking to buy. And this is a great way of doing it. It's going to be a few months before we can have a stamp show again, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, we want to be able to provide you with a way to buy and sell, and hopefully you'll take advantage of these services. Uh, educate. You can be an online educator. You can help us build our digital library, participate in our offerings, whether it's Summer Seminar Online, whether it's Stamp Chats, or whether it's some other variation of that. If you've, if you've ever wanted to do a presentation before, it serves two purposes, and always remember that. Not only are you educating the people who are listening to you at the time that you're doing it, but you're educating an entire audience that wasn't able to get there, but can watch it on demand. We are facilitating that. We want to make sure that this knowledge that so many people have contained can be shared and can be recorded. And there is no better time than the present to do that since we all have a lot of restrictions on being able to get out of the house. Right. It's always great to have people submit articles to the American Philatelist. I gave you the website data because I wanted you to understand when we say, hey, maybe this would be good for the website. We're telling you, hey, we're going to give you the biggest audience you could possibly have to look at this. And, you know, because the AP has a significant number of people, we're the largest magazine circulating today in the hobby, but now we have the largest circulation online as well. And we're going to continue to invest in growing that audience. And you have a chance to help us drive the traffic to us to, to educate people and share what you know. Stamp clubs, invite us. I participated in probably about 10 or 11 online meetings at this point, maybe a few more than that. Um, everything from the Collectors Club of New York to the Omaha Philatelic Society to uh, my friends in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Stamp Club, who are now meeting weekly on Monday nights. I have to be honest, they meet at, at 7 o'clock their time, so it's 10 p.m. my time. It, it, it can be a grind sometimes to get there, but I do it because it's great and it's a lot of fun. I got to meet with my uh, hometown stamp club, if you will, the Tidewater Stamp Club in Easton, Maryland, which is where I grew up, and got a chance to see some folks that I have never met before, even though they came from the same area I grew up in. And so it's been a great way to start connecting with people and meeting people you've never met. I, I would encourage clubs to also think about opening their doors and saying, hey, why don't we have people from around the country come and join us? Um, you know, at the Golden Gate Club, Bruce Marsden, who's our treasurer, did a presentation last week. Um, that I found particularly interesting. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a Swiss state in the middle of Italy and, uh, and they have postage because they have to be able to get mail out of the country. So it was really fun to listen to what people are interested in and sharing what they've learned about that subject. Our dealer members, support the hobby builders. We have the largest database of dealers in the country and they are ready to serve you today. Uh, I talked to a lot of dealers who are putting material online, who are advertising more than they've ever done before. Who are, uh, who are doing everything that they can to get stamps and material in your hands. They know your home, they know you're looking to fill holes, 
and they want to be a part of that. A lot of those folks are very knowledgeable people, and they are relationships that can last a lifetime. There are some great people in the dealer community, and I really would encourage you to, to go past the ones you see, the same ones you see at the show every year, and really start looking into some dealers out there that, that you, maybe you haven't met before. Uh, recruit. Our members are the best recruiters, and we can grow. Um, I'm always confident of that, but, it, but we need help. You know, we put the message out there, but a real honest to goodness testimonial from an individual member helps. So I've said a lot today. Now I'm going to, I'm going to end this with something that I want to talk about. It, it, it's, um, it's been a burr in my side for a while, but I want you to walk away from this conversation with something slightly inspirational. And so hopefully this is it. My apologies, first of all, to the, uh, the six gentlemen in this picture. This is from our summer seminar, 2019 front and center is Jeff Shapiro. The reason why I'm showing you this picture is we posted this on Facebook last year and we got these comments. Um, with all due respect to the folks at the uh, seminar, where are the young folks? Uh, we must continue to endeavor for the kids to come back into the fold. It's so sad not to see any, any young folks when I take my daughters to the local shows. Now, some people who are on the call have the same sentiment. And I want to share with you why I think you need to work harder on looking rather than lamenting so often that there aren't young people in the hobby. Because when I see the hobby, I do see these, these people. And as an aspiring old man, I want to be one of them one day. But I also see Charlene Blair, who was the founding, one of the founding directors of the National Museum of African Americans on Stamps. Uh, she got a bronze award for her Marian Anderson exhibit in Richmond, Virginia in 2017. And she, she realized after that, that she was probably, uh, she was probably exhibiting to the wrong group of people. And so Charlene, uh, has started taking out pop-up exhibits on the road to different events to show young African-American children that there are people like them on stamps and people like them that collect stamps. And I think that's an incredible outreach mission. And I really appreciate what Charlene is doing. I also see Danny Levis. Danny is a third generation APS member. Her father passed away when she was very young and he was a stamp dealer. Now, because of that, Danny and her family were adopted by our community. And she was able to foster her interest in stamp collecting and more, more importantly, in first aid covers. And she became a cache cover. I met her at AmeriCover in Northern Virginia uh, in 2017 and she became a part of the YPLF program. She has finished, she's got her graduate degree now, and she's an associate editor for Scholastic Art Magazine. She has two passions in life um, that she brings to the hobby. One is science and the other is art. Um, she's a cache maker and she's still very active in the hobby. If you wanna read about Danny online, we have a story about her on our website, and I think you'll find her to be a very interesting person. Um, I think about Ruit Sinha and Ruit came to us through, he was in a graduate program at South Dakota State, and he has a real interest in chemical, uh, chemical analysis and saw the interest in uh, philatelic analysis that he could do for the hobby. You can see here he's with Richard Judge, who is one of our great APS members who comes to Volunteer Work Week Summer Seminar. This is from Summer Seminar last year where Richard and Ruit are going over spectrum analysis information, uh, not something you normally hear people talk about in the hobby, but um, he's a YPLF alum. He studied analytical philately with Dr. John Barwis, who was his mentor last year, aside from Richard. Uh, and he developed a color, uh, a color detector for stamps, which he calls Kathy, named after Kathy Brockville, who's our director of education, because she really helped foster him so much in what he was doing. Think about Suzanne Ray, who is, uh, who just generated a very interesting story in the UK. Suzanne's the chair of Philatelic Traders Society. Uh, she promotes philately through stamp art. You can see her online, Twitter, and Instagram at Art Stamp. And for those of you who saw the article from the UK about millennials getting involved in the hobby through COVID-19, Suzanne is the reason why that article was there. She was the prime example. She was the prime driver. And I really appreciate her helping to get folks educated on the fact that it's not just old folks that are in the hobby, but it is everyone is in the hobby. And I think about Graham Beck, who is a very unique individual. Graham started exploring stamps online in 2016. He had a passion for videography and an interest in stamps. It's become a passion for doing videos about stamps. And uh, he started off very humbly, 
But over the last couple of years, he's grown his subscriber base. He now has 11,600 uh, subscribers and growing. And he really has a wonderful set of programs that he puts out every year. He, uh, he's been doing a great job and it is a very family friendly set of videos that he does there and they're very educational. And I really appreciate all that Graham is doing. And I think about Tassos Kalfas, who's a YPLF alum. And what's really interesting about Tassos is when he came to the YPL program, he had not only just graduated from high school, but he'd also gotten his associate's degree and was on his way to American University to finish his undergraduate degree. While he was in the YPLF program, he worked with Dan Piazza at the National Postal Museum and really generated an interest in the uh, curatorial side of the hobby that manifested itself in him doing an internship at the U.S. Postal Service and then getting employed by the uh, USPS Office of Inspector General, which he started the last year. Now, I want to make a note. He just turned 21. I believe this young man could very well be the president of the APS, at least, and probably the president of the United States at most uh, at some point in his life. Here he's doing a presentation for us. This is, uh, this is two years ago when he was just the tender age of 19. He is a very well-read, very well-researched young man, and I think you will find him most impressive. But I want you to understand something. These are just examples. And I know that we get frustrated when we go to stamp shows and we go to stamp clubs and all we see are older people who look just like us. But the, the reality is what this digital moment has given us is access to a group of people who have the same passion for the hobby that you do, who are a little bit younger, who come from a different walk of life, who have different life experiences than you do, and they, but they still have that same passion and they are trying very hard to keep this hobby going. So my contact information for those of you who need it, I try to be as accessible and responsive as possible. Uh, I answer mail, phone, you name it. Um, stamp collecting has been around for 180 years, official as of Wednesday, uh, when we celebrate the 180th, 180th anniversary of the use of the penny black. And uh, we have withstood over six generation pandemics from the Spanish flu in 1918, uh, economic downturns from the Great Depression to the economic recession of, of 2008, 2009, world wars, and so much more. We can get through this. Our hobby still has a place in this world, and I hope you'll join me in making sure that it goes on to the next generation as well. So with that, uh, any questions or comments or suggestions, and I apologize for how long we went. Well, Scott, uh, we have a, a bunch of uh, questions already. I would encourage anyone who uh, is listening in to put their questions in the question queue that is uh, up on uh, GoToWebinar, and we'll, uh, we'll ask those along, uh, myself and, uh, and Heidi, who is our social uh, marketing coordinator. So let me start off. Uh, we have a couple of questions about circuit sales and circuit books. Uh, Another question about the uh, the fines that uh, how long will the fines be waived? Uh, was that 30 days, Scott? Or uh, that... June, yeah, through through the rest of May, June 1st, uh, the we will start imposing fines again. Look, I, we're going to work with people if if you're having difficulties getting into there. Uh, please keep in touch with Wendy Mazzorti if you're in danger of of being fined uh, for the circuit books and for for anything you know for that. Same thing, same holds true for the library as well. If you're in a spot, you just can't get the book back to us. Reach out, don't ignore it. Just make sure that you're communicating with our staff and we can work through each one of these. Circuit books going to local clubs. When is that gonna start up again as soon as we get in the building? Is that correct? Well, it, it depends on the club. I mean, many clubs aren't meeting and um, we do have a club that still meets in person, believe it or not. Uh, and we sent out books to them a little bit over a week ago. It's really club by club. So just the same thing, which is get in touch with Wendy Mazzorti. We, you know, what, what we hear often is that, oh, I'm gonna get them and then I'm gonna take them to each person's house. That's not the way the program is supposed to be run. And so for the, in, in the interest of protecting the seller's property while it's out in the, uh, in the circuits, we wanna make sure that they're being handled safely and securely. We really would prefer them be at a group stamp meeting together. Uh, but again, I really would encourage folks to reach out to Wendy and Carol and have a conversation with them. A uh, question about uh, the uh, stimulus assistance. Uh, we did file for for some of that. Uh, there's a question from a, from a member about it. We did. We we filed in the first round. The APS Board of Directors approved us pursuing funds under the Paycheck Protection Program on April the 17th. We 
were notified that that loan was uh, approved and that the funding was sent to us. It's a two month bridge to make sure that we're paying salaries and uh, payroll benefits for employees primarily. There are some allowances for rent or utilities or some other things like that. We really expect that most of the money that we use will be for payroll. It is a forgivable loan as long as we comply with the terms and conditions, which we believe we will. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, then over uh, sometime before the end of this year, we will have to apply for a forgiveness and uh, we'll be notified at that time whether or not we receive it. But I, I think the chances are pretty good given the, uh, given the way that it was laid out to us by the bank and what the guidelines we received from the federal government. Uh, members asking about uh, the uh, APS's uh, financial exposure if uh, the Great American Stamp Show is canceled. That's a huge concern. This is something I touched on. If we cancel the show right now, we're, we're liable for costs. Um, and so there's liquidated damages that go along with that. Now, you know, my position now is, look, there are a lot of people who are about to risk exposure for trying to come to the Great American Stamp Show and for us trying to market it. And so uh, it's really my hope that we can help convince the convention center that there are different ways of doing this than going through a legal process. It's possible and likely that we can walk away from this contract if the state went ahead and just said, well, you can't do that. Um, I, I don't know what the probability is. Looking at the local data for, this, for Connecticut is concerning to me. Um, and I think it does, it does put a bigger question mark on this than I would otherwise have. But my goal is to try to get out of this without uh, doing damage to the APS. And that's what I'm committed to doing. Hopefully I can have a firm answer for our membership by May the 15th. Great, uh, Heidi, you have a few questions for Scott? Yes, when does the APS APRL expect to start accepting donations of stamps, covers, and literature? We have been receiving them and they're currently on hold in terms of acknowledgement. Um, I can tell you that part of the reopening process next week will include Leonard and Darlene Bloom, who will then start our donation processing again. Um, I was in touch with them over the weekend and they're very eager to get back here. Now where they're located is remote from everyone else in the building. Um, and I think they can come in and out safely and uh, without risking exposure to us or vice versa. So um, I feel really good that we'll be able to start processing those donations and getting acknowledgements out. So if you've been holding on sending a donation in, you can go right ahead and send it to us. And another follow-up, uh, does the APS APRL plan to hold a volunteer week? If so, when? Uh, no, we did notify those who had registered for the July volunteer work week that we would not be able to proceed. So unfortunately that's canceled. Um, in terms of whether we're going to do one later in the year, that's undetermined. I think that there are too many unknown variables right now for us to commit to that. I have a question uh, about uh, the expert, our expertizing service. Uh, what, what is uh, the latest on that, Scott? So I covered that in the presentation. And if uh, you need additional information, I'd get in touch with Gary Lowe. But we're a go for sending material in. We're moving the material from the experts back to the building and we'll get mailings out very soon. Question about volunteers. Are you working with any volunteers on a remote basis? Um, not that I know of. We have several volunteers that come in one or more days a week. Um, the balloons will be back in the building in, on Monday. Um, in terms of the rest of them, not currently, but if there are needs that we have and, and uh, folks out there who can volunteer, even if it's remotely, um, we're certainly willing to entertain that. Um, I'd encourage you to get in touch with the education department. That's usually the first place to go for volunteer opportunities. And then it gets distributed from there to the rest of the staff. We have a member asking about uh, how the APS CARES program is doing. So we started the APS CARES program and there's gonna be an email that goes out tomorrow, which is why I didn't hit it heavy tonight. Uh, but the program is to, uh, for, for members and supporters who really care about our staff. And we, you know, we launched it a little bit over a month ago. It's raised about $16,000. I've got some pledges for more than that, but until the money's in hand, I don't like to, to count that. Um, I think that the, the email tomorrow will also generate some further contributions. We've seen ranges and donations. For those of you who want to know, this is to help 
cover payroll cost if the the money that we got from the federal government doesn't help and we have some unforeseen circumstances that put pressure on our budget again we want to be able to keep the staff on board if we you know at all but through all means possible what the request to me was is that if we didn't do it for that then would we be able to give the staff a bonus at the end of the year and the answer is yes that's the plan so the money that you donate will be used in 2020 for the staff directly to the staff not counting me i'm a donor not a recipient uh into the aps cares fund so i always want to make that clear to people um, that i'm a supporter in this case and i'm not a beneficiary but um the sixteen thousand dollars is where we're at if you want more information go online we've got some staff profiles up and there'll be more coming but you can look forward to another email tomorrow that talks about the program and um, shares those stories with you about Kathleen Edwards and Helen Bruno, and we'll have some more coming along the way. A couple of questions about summer seminar. Uh, uh, when will uh, registration deposits be refunded? Um, yeah, that's the question. So for those of you who've already asked for uh, a refund, my expectation is that we'll be able to generate that within the next few weeks. Um, some other members have said, oh, just keep it and we'll carry it forward. So when you do summer seminar next year, or uh, some have even made it a donation to a, one of the programs that we do here. So if you've got an email, but you haven't responded, please do that. Um, for those of you who've asked for a refund, you will get it. I would expect no later than, than May the 20th. Uh, uh, question uh, from uh, members uh, about uh, the tenants that we have at the uh, match factory are they uh, are they help are they paying the rents at this point yes everything is going along according to plan we do have a vacancy that we had planned on um from one of our tenants we have projected out um if if you were with us in the board meeting last week of the last town hall um right now we're we're budgeting as though we're not going to fill that space again my hope is that we will but even if we budget um, even if we budget that we don't receive rent for that space this year, um, everything with the APRL side of things still is in good shape. We can make not only our monthly mortgage payments, but we can make accelerated payments as we've been doing. And if anybody has a potential tenant, then we certainly have some great space to show them. <laughs> I'll just put the ask out there just in case. <laughs> uh, there was a question about weddings at the APC, obviously, right now. Uh, those are not uh, not being held. No, yeah. in fact, we got contacted today about a wedding on June the 5th, and we had to unfortunately take a pass on that. We have no planned wedding events until August, and we're still evaluating things, and we'll make a determination a little closer to the time then. Uh, someone's asking about how much traffic is being driven by Facebook engagement to uh, APS and APS dealers. I, I will say, um, you know, we have a number of programs with uh, with dealers to uh, post their uh, material on on Facebook and other social media, and so uh, we get good engagement on on those uh, those kind of things. And if uh, if a dealer would like to uh, to utilize those, please uh, get in touch with Helen Bruno, our uh, sales our sales manager, or myself, Tom Lubig. Let's see. Someone was asking if the uh, if our show could be uh, rescheduled later in the year? Um, I don't want to get ahead of the planning that we have to do with the American Topical Association, the American First Day Cover Society. I think what we need to figure out first and foremost is what is the reality of August and then after that what options might be available to us that doing it later in the year might be an option but um, there could be some other options as well. It, if we get back into the show circuit again it's going to be a little difficult for us to, to, to find a weekend in the fall um, that we would be able to do it, but we're certainly going to explore all options we have. But like I said, right now, we just need to get some sense of resolution on whether or not we're going to be able to do the, the meeting. And if we have to cancel Hartford, will we uh, will we go back there sometime? Oh, yes. I mean, we've been there a couple of times in the last 10 or 15 years. It's a great location. There's about 25 million people to draw from in the outlying areas that would be able to drive to the show. Um, most dealers tell me it's it's usually one of their best shows that they do, and uh, there's no question we would go back there again. In fact, I might even offer that as an option to them in 2024 if uh, if the convention center is willing to let us off the hook this year. 
All right. Uh, someone's asking about the APS Ambassadors uh, uh, program. Uh, uh, are those quarterly uh, quarterly meetings online, Scott? Uh, you know, we've done two so far, and and for the ambassadors on the call who haven't been to a meeting, they're sparsely attended. And you know, we're really trying hard to do as much outreach to the clubs as we can. You're our conduit back and forth, and so I really would encourage you to to either participate in those meetings or read the newsletters that you get on a monthly basis. Get in touch with Ken Martin if you uh, if you haven't been able to get the information and you don't know, and you want to know what's going on. I'd like to do those more frequently, more often, but I, you know, in fairness to everybody, I don't want to waste everybody's time if there's three or four people on the call. So I really hope we can build the audience here and make this something that's worthwhile for everyone. Is there an, a, a particular area of APS, APRL and greatest needs of uh, donations right now? You've talked about the uh, APS care funds. Is there anything else? Uh, we've got the book program, anything else uh, that uh, so, people might want? Uh, adopt a book, uh, APS CARES program, um, YPLF can always be supported. And I, but I would say uh, you could also donate to the Mighty Buck Fund if you haven't been a donor to that. Part of the reason why we were able to move so fast and so flexibly to get laptops and VPN connections and a variety of other things for our staff to take out of here is because of the Mighty Buck program. That program and all of its supporters are amazing. And uh, you know the the just a $12 a year donation multiplied by thousands of people has really created opportunities for us to, to make a meaningful difference, act very quickly in doing it, and making sure that we continue to serve you as best we can. Uh, someone mentioned, uh, as you were speaking about the uh, uh, 25 under 30 program, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? So we've had that out for a month now. We launched it in uh, on April the 1st, was, this was planned. I mean, it's not like something we just launched. Um, part of what we're trying to explore is whether or not there's an appetite for a digital membership um, and the mechanics of being able to manage that inside because for 133 years, we have, uh, you know, we've had a membership that's been tiered based on when you join. And so, um, you know, doing it year over year um, poses a lot of interesting opportunities and a lot of risks. And so we've got to figure those out before we move ahead. But we thought a youth membership for a digital only would be a good way to start that. The uh, enrollment in the first month, I believe is five. Um, I know that doesn't sound amazing, but considering we only, we only have about 1100 members total that are under the age of 40, um, it's a good start. I, you know, These things take time to penetrate. And so we're gonna continue to promote it and push it. I would encourage everyone here, if you know someone under the age of 30 who's interested in being a collector or an interested in being a member of the APS, it's a really low cost, affordable way of doing it. If you think about it, it's really two months of Netflix subscriptions, but you get a whole year's worth of benefits for it. So um, I think it would be a great way for us to introduce younger people to the hobby and get them connected and engaged, even though they're dealing with the other things in their life, um, this is a good way of doing that. Uh, we have uh, questions, repetitive questions about the summer seminar. Um, someone asked about how many how many uh, people were attending tonight. We had about 275 uh, in the uh, in the group, and uh, there's still quite a few still here. Uh, question about uh, expanding the digital only subscription to members over 30. And, and that's the next option here. This is, you know, we, uh, we had a planned implementation of this. And so it, it got set off a little bit just because of the, the, the pandemic. But um, I think over the next month or two, we're going to really start working through that before we roll out the membership renewals for 2021. Um, I want to have a definitive answer on that. I think there's definitely some appetite for it. What that would look like and how we would approach it is, is to be determined yet. Um, so, um, but news will be forthcoming on that, but there's definitely some interest in it and we want to help facilitate that if possible. Question about on the road courses, uh, plans to uh, take them uh, online and other number in C3A, right? Um, we do have some recorded versions in C3A. I don't know if they're ready to go just yet in terms of being able to purchase those and watch them. Um, I. 
I'd like to be able to take the concept of an on the road course and turn that into online. I don't think you can do an online session for eight hours in a single day, but what I do think you can do is um, develop that same level of depth and content that you would get at an on the road course, put it online and either, either participate in real time or, or do it on a, uh, an on demand basis for a lower cost. And, um, I think it would, it's something that we've, we should be, should have been doing and something we are going to do. Great. Uh, member asking, uh, the key differentiators regarding selling on APS circuits versus eBay, the advantages and disadvantages. Well, what, would I be circuits or, or stamp store? If we're talking stamp store, the, the difference is that you are, uh, you're sending a material to us. We're doing all of the heavy lifting for you. Um, I think our rates are very favorable compared to that, considering all the services you get out of it. Uh, relative to what you get on eBay, you're not dealing with the traffic of, of people emailing you on a regular basis. Um, and you, all the fulfillment, all of the, uh, I hate to say all the hassle side of it, but all of the, the work that goes into posting that thing and then fulfilling the orders and collecting the money and all that dealing with the returns, we do all of that work for you. So it's a, it's a comprehensive online sales service. If you talk about circuit books, now that's a little bit of a longer lead. You have about 18 months before you, you're really gonna start seeing, uh, you'll see the completion of that circuit. We, we send it out several times. And um, you know I think it's a really good way to, as a seller to, to move your duplicates. Um, if you're a buyer, you know, so many of our circuit buyers are, are looking to plug holes and, and looking to see what they can find. But I've talked to so many buyers who have decided to start collecting a new country or a new area topic or a revenue side. And um, this is a really great way of getting kicked out on that by, by getting those books in your house, looking over it and filling, you know, collecting right away a lot of uh, good cost material that you can start a, a, a new line of collecting with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I think that's the the questions that we have. Uh, any any closing thoughts, Scott? Um, there's a lot more that we're doing. Please go to stamps.org. Um, pay attention to what we're doing online. We're going to continue to communicate with you as much as we can. We have a we have more developments coming, more good news coming, more interesting programs coming, and you know our goal here is to make sure that we're meeting your needs, and so. We are gonna ask for your opinion and your feedback. We wanna hear it, uh, good, bad, and everything in between uh, to make sure that we're, we are earning your business every day. And that's our number one commitment for the staff. Our members come first. All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for attending tonight. Uh, we've been uh, broadcasting uh, live on YouTube and on Facebook Live. Uh, Probably uh, tomorrow morning, there'll be an uh, edited version of uh, tonight's uh, webinar that'll be posted up to uh, YouTube and uh, available also on stamps.org. So uh, if you miss something, you can go back and look at uh, either the recording of these live sessions or you can go to the uh, edited video sometime tomorrow. So thank you, Scott. Thanks, Thanks. to everyone for joining yeah. us tonight. It's been a great session. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.